From Microbe TV, this is Tweevo, This Week in Evolution, episode 24, recorded on October 23rd, 2017. This episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. Get $30 off your first order and free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twee. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today in Salt Lake City, Nels LD. Hey, Vincent. Great to be with you from LD Lab Studios version 2.0. <laughs> what do you mean? What's version 2.0? Well, with your assistance here, I've upgraded the audio uh, system significantly. I've got something called the Mix Pre 3 with all of these cables coming out of it. <laughs> and there are decibels. I don't even know what's happening. But uh, yeah, we've got an upgraded recording system here. Yeah, we set Nels up so we can have two mics in studio. They go into a recorder that records each track and then sends out a mix to Skype. So it should yeah, be, I, be nice for multiple guests, right? I think it's a significant upgrade. And in fact, one of the uh, motivations for this was I had a spectacular guest visiting today and was hoping to uh, sort of unveil this upgraded audio system. So Marco Vignuzzi is joining us from the Pasteur Institute. Really excited for this. Hey, Marco. Hi, everyone. Welcome to I'm not Twiva. sure that, uh, that I was the spectacular <laughs> guest, but I could f- sub in for whoever canceled. Nobody canceled. It was you. <laughs> you know, Nels is not, uh, doesn't yeah. praise everyone, so take it and run. Well, sure. <laughs> I guess keep the bar low. <laughs> what, uh, what brings you to Salt Lake City? Well, I'm I'm doing a, a a little American tour. I came uh, last week to to be part of a a meeting for a grant that mm. I'm running. Um, so that was in San Francisco, and uh, sometime next week I have another symposium between French and American scientists in Atlanta. Uh, so I needed to find a a place to to you know put down my suitcase for a while. Nice. So I thought Salt Lake would be would be a good choice. Have you been there before? I've been here uh, probably ten years ago, uh, and that was just for for the heck of it. So I came to see. Well, that's that's when I was uh, I was still a postdoc. Yeah, right. in California. Yeah, it's a nice place. And then you got Nels there, which makes it pretty nice. <laughs> right, Nels. <laughs> that's, that's very generous of you to say, Vincent. Yeah, Salt Lake is turning out to be, I think it's kind of coming along. It's a little maybe underrated in some mm-hmm. ways, under the radar a little bit, but um, there's some good energy here in the foothills of the Wasatch Mountains. And you're going to be sticking around there, I hear. Guilty as charged. So um, I've been going through the promotion, tenure and promotion process over the last few months. And um, I'm very happy to report that the LD Lab studios and the LD Lab itself will continue here at Salt Lake for the foreseeable future. Foreseeable future is a good one because you can't say forever. Can't say forever. You just but, uh, never know. You might get a good offer. <laughs> never know. We're having a good time and uh, we're going to keep it running. That's the plan for now. So, Marco, you're at the Pasteur Institute in Paris and you are the PI of a unit called the Viral Populations in Pasteur pathogenesis unit, right? Yes. Yes, I am. I've been there uh, since 2008. <clears throat> I used to know um, Mark Girard. Remember him? Uh-huh. Do you know him? Yes, yeah. I, I did know him. I was, because I had done my PhD at Pasteur from um, 97 to 2001. Mm-hmm. And at that time, Mark Girard, I think, was just closing his unit. Uh-huh. Uh, right, and it was, right. get, it was being taken over by Sylvie van der Werf. Who I also who, knew, yeah. Right, and she was switching to, to flu research, and, and I happened to to be assigned to her lab to do my PhD. Mm-hmm. Mark, of course, used to work on polio, and so did I. And so we were uh, competitors, I guess, for a while. I remember um, when I left David Baltimore's lab, I had made the infectious clone of polio virus. 
he, he wrote me a little note. I came in one morning, it was on my desk. He said, send the clone to Mark. <laughs> and um, not Mark, um, uh, Girard. Mark Girard, yeah, Mark. Yeah, yep. right, right, Mark without the O. Uh, <laughs> send it to Mark, because I knew that they were working on it. And um, he said, just send him your clone. He's a good guy and he'll be fine. I said, okay. <laughs> so I sent it to him. Those are in the days when people sent clones around. <laughs> right. right. And uh, it was fine. Never, nothing, nothing bad ever happened. But then I knew, I knew Sylvie. Now she was a, a member in his group. What was her relation to him? Was he a, she a postdoc there or what? She was. Uh, well, that's a good question. She, I no, actually, I think she came back and she she was a staff scientist. So you know, in in the Pasteur and certainly in the older times um, back then. There were these mega hierarchies, right? It was yeah, one yeah. big boss and everybody in a giant pyramid under him. Uh, so she was basically a PI within his large unit. Right, um, and right. then when he retired, the various PIs moved on to to have their own mm, smaller right, units. Right. I know she spent some time with uh, Eckhard Wimmer here in the U.S. Yes, that that was her postdoc, and at that time she also had uh, made a clone of polio. Right, right. and they, they were the first to show that you could transcribe RNA with T7 polymerase in vitro and it would be infectious. So that was a PNAS paper that she and, and Eckhart published, I remember. It was, was some time after the original clone, but that was the it was the upgrade version two to make it more infectious. No, no, that, that ended up being the clone that kind of drove my, my PhD studies That's for a right. long time. Out in Raoul's lab. So let's let's back up a bit and start from the beginning. Where are you from originally? So, at the very very start, I'm yep. from Italy. You were born uh, there. Hence, I was born in Italy. Yes, yeah. near. I was born in Bologna. I'm from the region of Romagna, mm -hmm. which is joined with the Bolognian region of Emilia. And uh, my whole family has been there forever, you know. And uh, and we uh, we left when I was five. So. Hence, I have the name. I genetically, physically look Italian, I suppose. <laughs> um, uh, but we moved when I was five and left for English Canada. Mm -hmm. So then I, I grew up in northern Ontario in a culturally remote town of Sudbury. Certainly back in the 70s and 80s, it was far from everything, even though it was a, quite a large city itself. Um, and that was northern Ontario. And then finally... Um, when it was time to go to school, I went to Montreal. I was kind of in need of a uh, city life and something bigger. Wasn't sure what it was, but I knew it, it, it had to be leaving where I was growing up. Uh, so I did my, my uh, Bachelor of Science at McGill in microbiology and immunology. Um, but I had done what started as a second major, I never did complete it, but uh, the second major was in just more uh, classic biology, uh, which turned out to be a good thing because it was there that I did uh, a couple of courses in evolution, hmm. which I otherwise never would have encountered in the you know more molecular biology curricula at the time. So from then, uh, at that point in Montreal, and especially at McGill, being a very international university, I had met tons of people from around the world and realized that the world is much smaller than I expected, and I just wanted to move um, back to Europe. So uh, I went to Italy just to, well, I worked in, in a lab at a, at a kind of a diagnostics lab in uh, Bologna, uh, but that was more just the excuse to get me to Italy and see my people again and figure out if I was Italian or what I was. I've, I've had an identity crisis all my life. <laughs> and uh, and I, I, I think I convinced myself I was Italian. I fully immersed in it, drank all the Kool-Aid. Um, but then at the time, um, military service was still mandatory. And so I had to leave or do a year or so of military service. Um, and not being finished with living in Europe, I chose Paris because most Canadians grow up kind of thinking of one of our two, you know, mother or father countries, UK or France, and just decided I'd move to Paris and continue studying and, and enrolled in a master's program at the University of Paris. That led to the PhD at the Pasteur Institute, 
And then uh, it was just time to move on again for uh, postdoc. And although I guess uh, before doing Paris, my every intention was to move to New York City. Uh, once I lived in Paris as a, a doctoral student with a PhD salary, it was so hard. I decided I needed to go to the West Coast where people were happier and smilier. <laughs> <laughs> And so I ended up at UCSF in San Francisco for six years. How did you um, get on to Rolandino's lab? What was the pathway that got you there specifically? Well, so there was, you know, I, I had been working in Sylvie's lab, which was a flu lab, but because of her background in picornaviruses, she was, she and Nicola Escriu, uh, who was a staff scientist, uh, they were using replicons of picornaviruses to, to, as vaccine vectors, mm -hmm. so to, to express flu proteins. And uh, Nicolas Griu had this idea. At the time, the whole thing of DNA immunization was the thing. Yeah. And so Nicola had the idea of why not use replicons for naked RNA immunization. And mm -hmm. that, that kind of was, was what I worked on. So naturally, when I was thinking of, of doing a postdoc, I, I was looking pretty much in the field of picornaviruses. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, I didn't have many opportunities to to go to meetings and, and meet people. So there was the Europic, which is kind of the international picornavirus conference, was being held in Italy at the time. Um, and so my, my bosses sent me there and I knew that was my chance. My one chance I had to nail a postdoc uh, position. And uh, I knew that Raul was there, um, as well as Carla Kierkegaard and, and of course all the other people from the West Coast, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, mm -hmm. So I had to figure out how to approach them and uh, appear smart, um, <laughs> uh -oh. which is the hardest thing to do when you're a PhD student and you're afraid of all these big famous people. Of right? course, yeah. Um, I was perhaps, I had the good fortune in at the time the, they needed, you know, for the, the social hour, they had mm -hmm. uh, this traditional dance troupe from Italy come out. Come out. And um, Raul perez Berkoff had to step away. He, he was the organizer of the meeting mm. and he was the one who could translate. Uh, so ultimately he asked if I would step in and translate from Italian to English and French. Mm. Uh, and I did that kind of simultaneous translation while the dance troupe was explaining the moves. And I think that kind of at least shot some spotlight on me yeah. uh, and made Raul and Carla and other PIs remember me That's when cool. I finally yeah. applied to them much later. So that, huh. that might be a, you know, the back door in Hmm. Inter interesting. And so when you were starting to train in the Andino lab, how much of this was sort of driven by the virology versus the evolutionary biology or the mix of the two? So, you know, when I, when I, I learned a lot from being in, in Raoul's lab and his, his way of, um, basically I learned to do leaps of faith, close your eyes and go for it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when I joined, it was originally to work on his vaccine projects. Mm -hmm. So he had that, the poliovirus Sabin strains expressing HIV proteins. And um, my actual original project had nothing to do with what my career is now, but um, it was to develop uh, bacteria to be suicidal and express T7 polymerase mm -hmm. and deliver the replicons or the viruses like positive strand viruses and basically to launch them from oh, wow. from yeah. within right yeah uh, ultimately that led to only two years of headaches mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. we did manage to get the the thing to slightly work um and thank you raul for not getting rid of me during the two <laughs> years where i had nothing but uh negative results mm -hmm. Uh, but during that time, I think when he was desperate and and thinking I need to to save this guy's career somehow, <laughs> he said, um, you know, uh, Shane Crotty in the lab had studied ribavirin as a mutagen mm -hmm. for the longest time. And he said, we don't know if you can have resistance to mutagen. Uh, probably we can. It'll be just some silly mutation. And maybe you could publish a short note in Journal of Virology and at least have something under your belt, mm -hmm. three months of work and forget about it. Mm -hmm. And that's how it started. So we did wow. that. And that led to, you know, the famous G64S mutation in the polymerase. I love it. Yeah. Found also, well, found by Julie Pfeiffer, who was, you know, everybody knows the story of Julie scooping me throughout right. life and, and kind of ruining my life until <laughs> I finally met her. 
Uh Um, But that's where it all started. And Mm. little did I know that that would actually become the the focus of my, my work from that point on. That's great. And actually, I'm curious. So today, would you kind of define yourself as a virologist or an evolutionary biologist or as an, how do you, how do you see this kind of mix? Well, certainly I'm a virologist because I didn't have the extensive formal training in evolutionary science. And that's often pointed out to me. <laughs> <laughs> me too, by the way. Yeah. And I mean, I, and I accept that. So I, I, I suppose my, as a, my safety, I know I'm a virologist, mm-hmm. that's for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I found this uh, wonderful comfort in thinking along the lines of evolutionary sciences. Uh, I One of the things in molecular virology that I've always struggle to do is to the kind of the the kinds of studies that focus very mechanistic on one protein and or or one mutation in that protein a very linear approach Mm -hmm. and uh, i've always struggled with that i'm not linear i'm very messy and all over the place Mm -hmm. and when i discovered sort of these studies of viral populations I felt I can really swim in this multi-dimensional world and Mm -hmm. it's fine I I don't need the comfort of being sure of everything that's great I think that that kind of science is almost gone because it's the way it used to be. And I remember when I cloned and sequenced polio, you know, it took a year and that was going to be it. You weren't going to do populations. You weren't going to do different isolates. You were just going to study one virus, one protein. But now you can do way more and you don't. And very few people, I think, take that linear approach anymore, which is good. Yeah, I think it's also, you know, it it can be generational as well. Maybe, Um, yeah. You know, I, I always try to figure out what in our in our background and upbringing d- determines how we look at the mm. world. And mm. so, suppose being Gen X and not wanting to be categorized or in a box or anything like that is probably one of the the first generations that start to look trying to look at bigger picture views. Although that's always been done, but mm-hmm. the approach to it is is yeah, different. Yeah. We'll see what millennials do with, with with it now. When you were looking for a job, then did you? Did you want to go back to Europe? Uh, actually, no, not necessarily. I, I was very happy in California. Mm-hmm. Um, but, of course, I you, you have to be ready to go wherever the job is. And my main concern was just get one. So I applied, I think I sent out 45 applications to anywhere in uh, um, in the United States, Canada, and across Europe. Um, when the Pasteur uh, opportunity arose, I I was a little hesitant because I I remembered kind of the old school Pasteur Mm. and wasn't sure if after coming from UCS and and California style, if I really wanted to kind of get back into something that was too structured. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was was once I, I came back and was seeing the changes and the evolution that's happening everywhere, it was, it, it you know, it turned out almost a, a no brainer. I mean, Pasteur has a department of virology, right? So it has 300 scientists that are solely focused on virology. And then the, the entire Institute is pretty much infectious disease or genetics development as related to, to infectious disease. So it's, it's a great place in, in terms of critical mass. Now, now one of your colleagues there, wasn't she a, uh, Remember the Andino Lab, Carla Sally? Yes. So I think that <laughs> that um, we always say on paper we look married. Um, sh- you know, she's my <laughs> science wife, and it's true that we actually. So she's Argentinian, but with an Italian passport. I was Canadian with an Italian passport. We both went to Pasteur Institute for our PhDs at the same time. And <clears throat> if you visit Pasteur, it's not that big a place. You can walk across it in about three minutes. There's 3,000 people there. Mm. And I had never seen her ever in the five years <laughs> we were there at the same time. And everybody eats in the same restaurant, right? So, oh, wow. so it was the same week in December that Raul uh, wrote us saying, you have a colleague that's joining the lab. You're both coming the same week. <laughs> and so I met her just kind of on the way out. Uh, then, of course, she became a best friend as well as a colleague. Um, and we both applied to this for this position at Pester. Uh, there was only one position, so we made it. I recall making it to the the f- short list of fifteen, then the short list of five, mm. 
And then at the end, um, I guess when it came to voting, it was split down the middle and they couldn't decide which to keep. And uh, they ultimately created two positions and we still, you know, we don't know for sure, but we never let them really understand whether we were married or not because we figured <laughs> if they take one of us maybe they think they have a two-body problem and yeah. we'll both get jobs that's right? funny that's funny <laughs> good whatever and you I mean, can the, use. yeah and then the, you know the best thing is when you're a young pi and you're just starting if you have a best friend a yeah. really someone you can trust because mm -hmm. you need someone at your level to kind of make sure you know just saying do, am i doing okay mm -hmm. Because, yeah. of course, you're, we're full of self-doubts throughout that whole period. Absolutely. So it's been great to have someone that just says, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. No matter what you hear from your superiors, it's fine. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> well, and sort of a theme maybe emerging. So with Julie Pfeiffer as well, where you have like what could on the surface be a competitive situation. So with Carla and you competing for a job or with Julie and you competing sort of in the same sandbox of polio virus evolution, but then actually realizing or things of uh, adapting to the point where these just become great colleagues, great friends, and how that sort of extends through in a deeper way. Yeah, and, I, and I'm, I'm very hopeful that this continues, right? I think that's also generational or, or even how, how times change, uh, despite the pressure for funding to be competitive. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean you have to be a competitor mm -hmm. all the time. And I, I've, I, I think it also plays with that uh, there's more diversity now among scientists. Yeah. Which is a good thing, yep. um, you know, both yeah, in terms sure. of female, male, older, younger, etc. Mm -hmm. um, but I do find, at least in virology, it's a very uh, positive atmosphere. You can kind of see it in all of the virology uh, Twitter sphere. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think there's more of a push now to be, you know, rather than compete, reach out and let the other PIs know what you're working on and yeah. try to to work on it together or at the same time in parallel. Totally agree. And I think this is a great, this is why one of the reasons I was excited to have Marco as a guest here today is he reminds me in a way of like a science impresario. I'm going to really go for the Italian connections <laughs> here of sort of reaching out in cool and just sort of personal ways to connect with other scientists. So whether it's the grants he was describing that he's now orchestrating with Ben Tanuver and others, um, or just emailing me out of the blue and saying, hey, I'm going to be in Salt Lake for a couple of days. Do you want to hang out? I mean, this is a really fun way to conduct science. And so um, really fun to do this. And thank you again, Marco, for showing up for Twivo and recording with us today. Well, thanks for the invitation. So this is uh, great, but I have to say that my generation was the total opposite. You know, we were, cra <laughs> we were just crazy competitors. I mean, the mm. people we've mentioned, um, uh, Mark Girard, um, Eckhard Wimmer, even Raul on Dino mm -hmm. and others, we were all crazy competitive, you know, wouldn't sometimes wouldn't talk to each other at meetings, um, had arguments and could never get by that. I don't know why, <laughs> because I, I see as, as Marco is saying, what's going on now, it's great. And it's more productive to be interactive and collaborative. But back then, you know, I'm talking about seventies, eighties, nineties. It was just crazy. Um, and uh, I, I, to this day, you know, these people, I, I, I remember the, 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 the nastiness of, of competition and it's not nice at all. Yeah. And I wouldn't say that's been a hundred percent extinguished from the radar screen, but mm -hmm. there really is a time where I think, you know, certainly for some of the old virology kind of, you know, battle lines that were drawn in our generation of scientists, we're sort of looking at this and saying, well, what if we do it a slightly different way? Yeah. And in, in some response, you know, in some ways, maybe a response to a pretty competitive funding scenario where teaming up is turning out to be a really great strategy for um, career survival or even more than that, thriving in sustaining careers these days. So let me tell you a story, a quick one, Mark, uh, Marco, about Mark. OK, so he mm -hmm. he visited my lab uh, just started, it was the early 80s, mid 80s. And we were working with this strain of um, polio virus that could infect regular old mice. It was mouse adapted. It's called the Lansing strain. And I had a student who had selected monoclonal antibody resistant variants. And some of those were attenuated in mice. Okay. And we had sequenced them, and the amino acid changes were in the VP1BC loop, which is on the surface of the capsid, right? 
So Mark came, and this was not published yet, and I showed this to him. I didn't know what it meant. About six months later, he publishes a paper showing if you take that, it was an eight amino acid sequence from this Lansing virus and put it into any other polio, it would make it infect mice. Hmm. So he came and he had this idea, and I was so pissed <laughs> he did this. <laughs> Because he got this idea from our preliminary, instead of saying, hey, this is what it could mean, he just went back home and said, oh, we're going to do this experiment. <laughs> and it bloody worked. So uh, actually before, and then I did something which was equally not good. So Eckhard Wimmer said, I just went to Mark's lab in Paris and I heard that they're going to publish this paper. And Eckhart said, let's do it and rush it out. <laughs> so we did the experiment. And and ended up publishing more or less at about the same time, which I think is crappy. You should have just published it all together, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, sure, but I mean, it, it's it's just you know a sign of the times. It was it yeah, was exactly. completely yeah. different back then. Yeah. Um, totally. Now now there's you know it it, it still happens, but you're going to be cal- called out on it. I, I think hope that so. the I, hope so, yeah. I think now the community will stand up and and point it out if that kind of thing happens. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now uh, we we would like to do some science. Talking with you, I have a paper um, that we'd like to talk about. But before we do that, I want to ask you some general questions about viral evolution, okay? Because I, I always ask these of people who do sort of what you do, like Nels and Adam Loring and other people, and I'm never happy with the answers. So I'm going to ask, <laughs> going to ask you. Guilty as charged. I'm I'm curious for some answers here myself. <laughs> All right, so I'm glad I'm I'm, I'm already sipping the whiskey now. So <laughs> Are you sipping the whiskey? Very good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've upgraded from our. Uh, we had some black tea, and now we've uh, graduated to the. Next what kind beverage. of whiskey are you drinking there? It's Glenfiddich, fifteen, fifteen year old single malt. Yeah, so this bottle was a gift from Matt Barber, uh-huh. um, one of the first grad students or uh, postdocs who came through my crew and is now running a lab. At the University of Oregon gave mm-hmm. me this bottle. It comes in handy on occasions just like this. Good. All right. First of all, um, it, you know, Esteban Domingo and his his colleagues term, uh, mm-hmm. coined this term quasi-species when they found that VSV pop- were populations and not just a single sequence, right? They, they showed it by oligo T1 fingerprinting. And the, the name stuck, quasi-species. But now... Um, I hear that it's not the right word. So maybe you could tell us, first of all, what what would you say is a viral quasi-species, and should we use that word or should we use something else? Yeah, so I'm glad I'm in the in the liquor already. <laughs> um, so actually, yeah, you might people might be surprised by my response, of course, because I came into the field, um, you know, naive and uh, from the virology side, so from those people that use the term quasi-species. Um, I mean, the short answer is, uh, no, it's not the right term for almost uh, all the ways we use it. Um, what, I, what I found is it's extremely helpful within virology because we don't think about viruses usually in terms of populations, and we're not evolutionary scientists in general. So often... People will talk about their virus uh, and think of one thing. In their mind, I think they have an image of one single virion. And so in virology, it's very helpful because it immediately snaps us out of that mm. and forces us to think of the population. Now, the, the term itself is correct, mathematically speaking, for all the formula that were developed but that wasn't for viruses. I think it was brilliant, the uh, analogy and the carryover from the maths to virologies in the 70s and 80s, where it was really for the first time we were realizing that these RNA po- virus populations are extremely diverse and never clonal. Um, at that point, I, I suppose that developed into a battle of schools of thought and, and ultimately of where the scientist is coming from, from population genetics. Of course, the argument is that word and, and the, the terminology uh, and the way of thinking is not needed because there are already classic population genetics models and terms that can describe the various things that we're observing when we study quasi-species in virology. Um, for the virologist, again, it's because it's easy to quickly move from the single to the population scale. Um, I myself 
have started to not use the word or use it very loosely, perhaps in the introduction of talks. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. unless we are trying to do experiments to directly address the quasi-species theories, then I find we can use other terms that uh, that is a happy medium for everybody, right? Like mutant swarms or mutant spectra or just heterogeneous virus populations. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I think that uh, Eddie Holmes, of course, who, who was someone that was very much against the overuse of the term quasi-species, I recall in one argument he published where it really s made sense to me what he was saying is he said, you know, there, these terms, using the term quasi-species often will try to attribute to the viral population some mystical force. Mm -hmm. and, and I realized even after publishing that, you know, very it's significant paper in Nature, uh, in Raoul's lab, where we had the term quasi-species in the title, um, for, I, I noticed that a lot of times in, in the future years, when people couldn't find an answer f for why their phenotype in, in their virus was the way it was, they would say, perhaps it's quasi-species, and then cite that paper. Right? <laughs> so it's just a blanket statement like there, it's something crazy coming from another universe, mm -hmm. quasi-species. So it's true, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not. And quasi-species, ultimately, the, the conditions the mathematical conditions required don't happen, right? The, it needs, the population has to be at mutation selection equilibrium, at infinite population size, at mutation rates that are s still above what we see in RNA viruses. So perhaps it sometimes occurs, but uh, for the most part it doesn't. And, and I think for when we just want to discuss population diversity, then we should perhaps use just more general terms. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So how, let's explore the extent of this diversity. So if I gave you a tube of a polio virus, a mill with you know ten million plaque forming units in it, how many different genomes would be in that tube? Well, potentially. I mean, they they from what we know of RNA viruses in general, they tend each time they replicate, they introduce one mutation on each genome mm -hmm. with each round of replication. Mm -hmm. So if there was no selection whatsoever acting on this population, you would have every mutation present at every nucleotide site. And then they would start to accumulate. So you would get even haplotypes forming. And and you'd, you, the, the potential for diversity is, is extreme, of course. Um, I'm thinking of the paper, uh, Rolandino's paper, where they used, they developed CircSeq for mm -hmm. the first time. And mm -hmm. I could really uh, do away with all of the background error from Illumina tech sequencing. There they saw that essentially you had about, I think it was something like 80 to 90% of the nucleotide sites presented mutants mm -hmm. at very low frequency. Mm -hmm. So I think in the most, uh, in the most permissive environments, such as cell culture with immortalized cells, you could very easily have millions of, or hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of variants, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. each slightly different from, from the next. Theoretically, you could have a population that's so diverse that your consensus sequence doesn't even exist mm -hmm. as an actual sequence. Right. right. Mm -hmm. But mostly when we do consensus sequencing, we get a consensus, right? So we, yes. I haven't seen that anyway. So this population could be, it could have 10, 10 million different viruses, which would mean that there is no, no more than one genome that's the same, right? Yes, that's, uh, that's theoretically possible in, in some kind of mathematical vacuum. But in reality, uh, the virus starts from a starting point. So if you, mm. if you start your infection with a handful of virion already, you you have, in a sense, the you know the original sin, so to speak. You have whatever genomes were there is what where the mutations will build upon, and then for RNA viruses, and all viruses really, they're very constrained. Yeah. They're such small mm -hmm. uh, genomes where every single nucleotide counts for something. Either it's coding for one or multiple proteins or functions, as well as RNA structure, uh, replication elements that. Most mutations on these viruses are either lethal or highly detrimental, and so they'll be purified out. Mm. So in reality, you won't find the total diversity. Okay. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point that sometimes maybe underappreciated 
in virus biology, whether it's RNA or DNA viruses, is how much constraint there is. So, you know, a lot of labs thinking about how do these things get around immune systems. And in one sense, it feels like for like hosts would be kind of in this hopeless scenario where because of the high mutation rates, the massive population sizes that RNA viruses, for example, could just sidestep every defense coming at them or sort of go under the radar, so to speak. But it's all that constraint, right? When every nucleotide, as Marco is suggesting, counts, that actually starts to level the playing field potentially and, mm. and make these uh, conflicts a lot more interesting from an evolutionary standpoint because hosts actually you know, are fighting without one hand tied behind the back, in a sense, as, as the way viruses might be. Does this kind of population uh, variability occur for all kinds of RNA viruses or just some kinds that have got different genome configurations and so forth? Does it matter? So I think the 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 mutate the mutation rates of these the error rates of these RNA viruses are all very similar, mm -hmm. okay. um, and we can see if ever we're able to have a biochemical assay for for some of them, right, where it's really just polymerase and an RNA template, we see that the error rate is very high. Um, then it's it it of course compared to all other genomes, yes, they all present extreme diversity, but there are instances where there is more diversity observed in populations compared to others. And, and that kind of makes it, again, when, when I talk about diversity, I'm looking at just what's inside of the strain. It's, it's intra-strain diversity um, and not so much on the, on the longer scale evolution of, of diversity between strains mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and evolutionary rates, right? So, so there are a lot of times we see that some of our RNA viruses evolve uh, more slowly than others in the long term. Oftentimes we talk about arboviruses, which cycle between uh, invertebrates and vertebrates, so mosquito-borne viruses, for example. They, they tend to have very slow evolutionary rates, and yet when in my lab, when we look at them just with the diversity that's in a population, it looks just like other RNA viruses. So, so ultimately it's the selective pressures that are acting on them might be more stringent. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, and I think it's going to be really exciting to kind of consider some of these uh, parameters when it comes to very different viruses, so like the large DNA viruses, where if you just measure mutation rates, they could, in some cases, be orders of magnitude lower, although there's certainly controversy around that, and Eddie Holmes has sort of weighed in in both directions. Um, but things like recombination and copy number variation start to emerge as other diversity generating mechanisms that can sort of level the playing field for those uh, very different classes of viruses. And so one of the great things about our field, I think, is really that we're just glimpsing at virus diversity in everything around us. And so to be able to sort of pull some of these understudied viruses and understand how the, they sort of uh, balance the equation, so to speak, will continue to be really interesting going forward. And I, I think with, with the, um, you know, now that, that sequencing technology is more accessible and mm -hmm. affordable, et cetera, uh, we don't know a lot about DNA, the large DNA viruses with respect to how they've been, how RNA viruses have been studied, simply because we couldn't cover the sequence data. Um, so at most, we have the, like, the very small single-stranded DNA viruses, and they do look a little bit like RNA viruses with their their diversity. The larger viruses would have less, maybe less diversity at the nucleotide substitution level. But as you mentioned, there's then there's genomic plasticity, and 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 that is an entirely other level of diversity that we tend not to look at in the small RNA viruses, mm -hmm. whether it's there or not or happens. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's still being explored. But all of that has to be taken into account as, a, as kind of the overall diversity measure. Yep. And just to echo on that, with the emergence of some of these new sequencing platforms, I'm thinking about the Oxford Nanopore system. Uh, in our lab, we recently just got these long reads. So we got a 110 KB single read, which is of decent quality in a large DNA virus. And it's making us look at these things with this sort of haplotype information in a whole new way. And so I think there are going to be some really fun conversations between evolutionary virologists ahead. So that gets around the problem of piecing small reads together, right? Correct, exactly. And so what we can do for sort of the first time is begin to look at things like uh, 
uneven cross or unequal crossovers and other mechanisms of recombination that um, might be sort of in the toolbox of some of these DNA viruses. Um, and then seeing whether maybe this is underappreciated in some of the RNA viruses and having that conversation going forward, right. I think is right. going to be really fun. Yeah. All right. Now, so, should we, should we move to the paper? <laughs> yeah. Speaking of moving forward. I mean, I could go, uh, I could go on, but let's, this, yeah, is, exactly. this is a very interesting paper. So let's do it. <laughs> totally agree. Yeah. So today, Marco, he could have p- picked from many papers. We're going to highlight a paper from June of 2017 that showed up in Na- nature microbiology. Title of the paper is Attenuation of RNA Viruses by Redirecting Their Evolution in Sequence Space. And so the first author of this paper is uh, uh, emerging new PI, uh, Gonzalo Moratario, probably butchering the last name. I'll let um, Marco (laughs) come in and clean it up a little bit. That's (laughs) good. So what's Gonzalo up to today? Is he running his own lab or what's going on? Uh, Not yet. He's in trend. Tra- in transition. Uh, he's still in my lab until March. So Gonzalo is Uruguayan. I have a, a big Uruguayan contingent in, in my lab. He was one of the first ones. And then he just kind of created a, a, a funnel from his country to, to our lab. Um, so he has uh, already a position as uh, an assistant professor at the University of the Republic in Uruguay. Mm. Uh, and hopefully he will be starting a lab at the Pasteur Institute of Montevideo. So, you know, Pasteur has yeah. 33 institutes around the world. Um, and that, that will be nice because it will allow us also to continue working together with inter-institutional grants, etc., and projects. So by, the time, by this time next year, he'll, he'll, he'll be starting his own group. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. All right, so there's a concept in this paper that I have a lot of trouble with because I'm just a dumb guy, I guess. But to, uh, and it's this this concept of sequence space, which you which is the key to this paper and has been the key to many recoding or rewiring efforts of RNA viruses. Can you explain uh, to a layperson what that means? <laughs> yes, I'll try. So um, sequence space ultimately is I always describe it as uh, the, the, well, the reality is sequence space is a multidimensional hypercube, right? So in mathematical terms, and I'll, I'll dumb it down in a second, but in mathematical terms, basically for uh, nucleotide sequence space, if you have a genome of 10,000 nucleotides, then the sequence space would be 4 to the 10,000, right? Mm-hmm which is this actually more than all the molecules in, in the universe, <laughs> because it, it represents every combination possible of all 10,000 nucleotide sites for all four nucleotides you could have at that, those positions. Mm-hmm. So mathematical sequence space is vastly huge, but it can describe, if you can imagine being able to map that out, then you would be able to place your virus and all of its variants somewhere in that space, Mm -hmm. kind of like a GPS coordinate. Mm. And that's how we approach it. We look at a virus starting in one place in its sequence space, and that's its GPS coordinate. Where it can move depends on where it started, Mm -hmm. what Mm -hmm. nucleotide sequence it already has, right? Because if you do one mutation per round of replication, then you, given whatever codon you have, you will become possibly another amino acid, but not all of them necessarily because they're not all accessible to your neighborhood of mutations Mm -hmm. because of the codon you have, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where we've been working on. And in, in the lab, we've been using... We've been working with mathematicians to try to map out how much of that mathematical space is actually inhabited by Mm -hmm. viruses. And then from the biological side, we ask, can we figure out where it is and then change its evolution to point it to bad areas, areas where the virus can no longer thrive? Hmm. So, and that brings up maybe this, uh, another concept uh, of mutational robustness. And so how does robustness, or first of all, maybe helped by defining that a little bit. And then how does that relate to the these sort of sequence neighborhoods that you're describing? So the, the idea of mutational robustness or genetic robustness has been uh, receiving more and more attention in virology over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, a lot of the, the, the really cool work and, and great reviews are written by uh, Santiago Elena, I would and 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 Rafa San Juan in Spain. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also some good work um, 
by Adam Loring mm -hmm. that that uh, kind of approaches it experimentally. Mm -hmm. Basically, um, the mutational robustness would be the constants constancy of phenotype in light of genetic change. So basically, it's your ability to buffer your phenotype or your fitness despite getting genetic attacks. The best way to describe it in simplest terms would be if your codon mutates and it's a silent mutation, that would make you more robust because ultimately nothing happens. You will still be able to produce the protein and have the same function. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you are mutationally more brittle, the codon change will dramatically alter the amino acid, possibly to one with properties that are no longer tolerated by the protein. Mm -hmm. Or in the case of this, this paper here, we directed them towards stop mutations, mm -hmm. which would truncate the protein or the entire polyprotein of the virus and kill it. Let me ask you about the sequence space. So I look at it as a three-dimensional plot and say there's a, a peak, a mountain, if you will, and that would mm -hmm. be the space for that virus. Is that a reasonable way to look at it? Well, so there what you're doing is you're building a fitness landscape, mm -hmm. um, which which is ultimately it's, and this is something we've been aiming to do and we're getting closer and closer to it. What you would have to do, because sequence space is multidimensional, and to be able to visualize a landscape, you'd have to break it down to two dimensions. Mm -hmm. That's important. That's not going to represent the true sequence space, but with mathematical reduction, dimension reduction models, you, we are able to get close. So you're hoping to basically break it down so you can have two dimensions, a map mm -hmm. that you put on the horizon that roughly gives you an idea of where that virus is in sequence space. And then atop of this map, you would build a topography, a landscape, which would represent its phenotype or fitness, for example, so that mm -hmm. a virus that is better than where it started is a peak and a valley represents worse. Mm -hmm. So, yes, what, what you would imagine is that for a virus that is happy, that's well adapted for your environmental condition or whatever cell you have it growing in, mm -hmm. then that virus should be fairly well adjusted, well adapted to the environment. It should be found on an upper region of a fitness peak. Not necessarily at the very top. Uh, as you passage the virus in the same conditions and never change the environmental conditions, then you're going to expect adaptation to improve for that specific environment. So it would climb the peak, mm -hmm. trying to get to the very top. Mm -hmm. But as soon as the environment changes, then that peak may no longer represent the ideal fitness for your population. Uh, and suddenly you'll have to move now to another peak that represents the new environmental optimum. Mm. And to do that, you move there through mutation or through recombination, through reassortment, mm. et cetera. Mm. And the question is uh, that we try to address is if you are too far from that new peak, you may not be able to access it with just one or two mm -hmm. stepwise mutations. So the neighborhood may be too far and you may never get there, especially if your environment changes very quickly. What do you mean by far? Is this sort of like a linear thing where you just move no. along? Not at yeah, all. No, so, so ultimately these are still, you know, fittest landscapes are just conceptual and they're very helpful in visualizing movements in sequence space, but mm. it might not be that clear. But ultimately the steps, the movements in the map of the landscape are determined by genetic changes or different sequences. Mm -hmm. So for a virus, you can imagine that can be as little as one or two nucleotide substitutions. Mm -hmm. We see that for, uh, for instance, in our work where we, we looked at the, the jump of chikungunya virus from one mosquito species to another, that was just one mutational change. Mm -hmm. So ultimately that peak should be very close to the original peak in the landscape because it's only one nucleotide away, one step. Uh, but for viruses, you can imagine they can also take jumps by recombining. Mm -hmm. That would put mm -hmm. them farther in the the the, the sequence space. Mm. Yeah, so maybe it would be uh, helpful. I mean, so we're talking about neighborhoods, landscapes, and these <laughs> concepts get pretty complicated in a hurry, maybe. Um, but to move a little bit from the theory to the experiment, I mean, this is what is really exciting about this paper and all of the work that Gonzalo put into it is so they – and uh, they – Authors genetically engineered both Coxsackie virus and influenza A virus, 
with the idea of putting these vir- the sort of wild type, if you will, viruses into bad neighbor bad mutational neighborhoods. Would that be so, the, would that be the Bronx or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, you'd, I guess you know, not. I I wouldn't want to disparage talk the Bronx, bad right? about the Bronx. Yeah, that, I mean, they have <laughs> yeah. such cool things to That's right. cool hangout spots. But uh, I guess it depends who you are, right? But ultimately, you know your neighborhood and you know where you want to go. Um, and you're we we are trying to find ways to push them into neighborhoods where they're not so comfortable. Yeah. Do you, so do how you, know, you do that? Do you, before you do that, do, do you know how many base changes you would need to put? A virus in a bad neighborhood, or does it depend? Well, you know, I mean, I, I, of course I, I don't. And mm-hmm. that would be the idea if we can get a good map of a virus's local sequence space and fitness landscape, then we would learn how many changes. Okay. But I think, uh, I, I think things like live attenuated vaccines tell us, you know, mm-hmm. the polio mm-hmm. vaccines are in a bad place in sequence space. And the one, uh, I think the type 1 va- Sabin vaccine has 50, 52 nucleotide changes, and that's in a very, very bad place. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I think it, it can be relatively few steps. Mm-hmm. Uh, viruses, these aren't viruses, they, they exist in very precarious situations. They're, they're, they're trying to stay in an optimum, but they also need to move very quickly and be evolvable. Uh, but at the risk that most movements will will cause them uh, detrimental fitness effects. Yeah, and so one of the sort of clear detrimental um, fitness effects would be if you become riddled with stop codons. And so how th- that and that's what's the idea of this work. So with Coxsackie and influenza. How is it that you put them into bad neighborhoods? Well, so here we we or originally we wanted to find a way to really target a virus's future without changing its present and to address these questions of either robustness or even evolvability, uh, the ability to make adaptive mutations. And so we, but we needed to do this in a way without affecting all the other things that happen when you change nucleotide sequences in an RNA virus. Mm. So this started even as an idea. I was still a postdoc in Rao's lab when I realized just looking at the, you know, the codon tables and the redundancy of codons that serine in particular and leucine as well, as well as arginine have six, right? Mm -hmm. Six different codons. And I noticed that serine was very close to a stop mutation. So I thought if there was a way that we could alter the serine uh, codons in a virus to still code for serine, but be only of the category that is very close to that stop mutation, that would allow us to measure the, the how precarious of a situation viruses usually are in by uh, given their their extreme mutation rates, right? Mm-hmm. So I guess the idea here is, given the degeneracy of the genetic code, depending on the codon that you have, you could be one mutation away from a stop codon, you could be two mutations away from a stop codon, and that serines and leucines, in particular, just the way they're coded, are uh, sort of more precarious in the sense that with one mutation, you could get a stop codon. Yeah, there we have, of the six leucine and six serines, two of them, uh, can two of each can give rise from one single nucleotide change to a stop mutation. Mm-hmm. And we had, what's nice is you have the control, the opposite, where we call that category no stop, and that means you need two mutations to get to the stop mutation. Mm-hmm. And so that way what we did is we, we altered all of the serine leucine codons in the in in one gene so in in Coxsackie it was the p1 region in flu we tried ha um we did i believe pa we did a number of them and so we altered about 100 codons um and uh, we were also fortunate that these codons don't actually alter the CPG content, which is a lot of nice work by the Simmons lab that showed codon shuffling will attenuate viruses that way, mm-hmm. uh, as well as Eckerd Vimmer's work that showed that you introduce uh, codon pair bias that mm-hmm. can also attenuate viruses. So we were fortunate these leucine serines don't do that. Yeah. And we didn't hit anything that required uh, any RNA structure required for replication. Hmm. So we were able to focus only on the question of robustness, evolvability, and what happens in the virus's future. And so I guess the um, trick with this is that if you have, if you're making mutations in these viruses that alter the RNA structure or introduce these codon, uh, this codon bias, which would be these sort of 
intriguing patterns of two codons together somehow altering the translation that you would be sort of adding side effects that could influence virus fitness, but you were able to sort of do a more pinpoint experiment to just really try to ask the question of whether being close to stop codons would influence ultimately the virus fitness. Yes, and it's, you know, a lot of the really lovely work on codon optimization, de-optimization, shuffling, the the death by a thousand cuts that's often described by yeah. Vimmer's lab, mm -hmm. that really attacked all of the codons. They changed hundreds and hundreds of codons and, and codon sites, and it's, it's amazing. You can fine-tune the level of attenuation, but probably it's the result of a number of things, such as translation efficiency, replication, et cetera, et cetera. Um, here, we really tried to focus only on what happens as a virus mutates and the potential role of, of robustness or the adaptability mm -hmm. in attenuating. So the viruses you made, uh, the, this, the ones that can go one change to a stop, they seem at first glance pretty normal, right? Yes. So in, if, you, if we just replicate them in cell culture, they have basically wild type like replication kinetics they show some you can see some uh, fitness defects and almost immediately but nothing that would be indicative of having touched on replication or translation all all, all those things as we mm -hmm. measure them looked mm -hmm. pretty much wild type um and uh so and also with we with what little we could do with trying to model the RNA structure, it didn't look like we altered it. Of course, you know this was just looking at mfold on the small piece. Mm -hmm. But what we were uh, we were comforted in seeing that our no stop control, t uh, technically by the model, would have had more RNA structural changes than the one to stop. So that was sort of the perfect comparison, since we had all hundred leucine serines changed in that no stop control as well. Mm -hmm. So, and yeah, really cool internal control. And then how are you defining actually virus fitness here? And how are you measuring it? So here in the, in these studies, we did the very, I guess the most correct and classic, uh, measure. It's a direct competition assay. Um, in virology, we tend to use fitness very loosely and fail to define it in most of our papers. So often we'll fitness of two virologists just means replication rates. And it's often just one virus grown alone compared to another virus grown alone. Uh, for the more classic evolutionary method, you would have to compete them. And so we do low multiplicity of infection competition in the same cell culture, one to one ratios, and we measure the amount of virus. We're lucky in, in these cases, we can use uh, highly quantitative fluorescent probes, QRT-PCR, so we have very good measures of what the progeny is over three different cycles, and mm -hmm. then we find the slope, and using a classic formula, get the relative fitness, how much better or worse the virus is. So initially, the viruses are very similar. As we start to put pressure on them, either we grow them uh, and passage them over time, or we actually bombard them with mutagens to force mutation, mm -hmm. then we see dramatic differences emerge. So... You put mutagens, you passage them, and then you get a, a decline of fitness of these stop viruses, correct? Yes. So we found that uh, both in cell culture as well as in vivo, as the viruses replicate with their natural mutation rates, they start to mm -hmm. accumulate these stop mutations. And we can see those in by deep sequencing the progeny virus. So both in culture and in vivo, we see that those one to stop uh, viruses have more stop mutations in the progeny, which would indicate truncated genomes, especially for, you know, for Coxsackie virus, since it's right at the beginning of this polyprotein. Mm -hmm. If you truncate that, you can't express any other viral protein required for replication. Mm -hmm. so but that, again, that, these... Go ahead, yeah. sorry. Well, these remain relatively rare occurrences, right? So out of your entire population, only a small percentage are presenting these stop mutations. Yet the entire population is screwed. Because these guys, yes. you, you say they make smaller plaques, right? Yes, and the, in, in vivo, these populations are cleared more quickly. Mm -hmm. Now there, there's an uns unanswered question, hmm. and it, I, I, I can't imagine that the only reason these populations are disappearing is because one or two percent of them have stopped mutations. Mm -hmm. I, what we 
are thinking is that these viruses, as they mutate, are more visible to innate immunity and to to other immune responses, hmm. either because the truncated proteins somehow are indicating some kind of danger signal, hmm. or that the RNA mut the mutations at the RNA level are also exposing the virus and and making it more visible. Hmm. I like to imagine the viruses have evolved to hide as much as they can. Yeah with their secondary structures, et cetera, from the innate immunity. And if we start to mess with that, then they become more visible. So it's not just a matter that you've pushed these viruses into a different sequence space, and now they can't get back or where they need to go just to replicate in a cell. It's not that simple. It's that you think there's a specific mechanism for their altered phenotype. Yeah, I think I think it's a it's going to be a combination. I find with everything that I've studied, it's never as simple as that one paper shows, right? Mm -hmm. So I think ultimately, yes, and that 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 comes back even to all the work on fidelity variants of viruses that have higher or lower intrinsic mutation rates. I don't think that the attenuation is as easily explained as just having more mutations on those few genomes. There has to be some kind of uh, role of host response and how the host might perceive these populations differently. That remains to be addressed. Mm -hmm. So, in speaking of hosts, so up till now, the experiments we're describing are done in cell culture in vitro. And, um, and then with treatments with different drugs, which will influence the mutation rate. And that's sort of the stressor that you're putting on here. So then in addition to these experiments, so you also moved in this study to in vivo experiments. So uh, what actually did you do? Well, so there we, we uh, in both cases for Coxsackie virus as well as uh, influenza A, we used mouse models. Uh, initially, it was just to see, to observe whether attenuation occurred. So it was simply infecting mice with different uh, doses of the virus compared to wild type. Uh, and in both cases of flu and Coxsackie virus, we saw that the one to stop viruses, so the ones that are closer to stop mutations, were attenuated. Not necessarily severely attenuated. In, in many cases, we saw that cl viral clearance was more uh, occurred more quickly. Maybe uh, we'd see it at day five or at day seven, whereas for wild type and the no stop controls, we would see virus still present after a week. Mm -hmm. So it's not complete attenuation, but it's it's a higher clearance. Mm -hmm. Then for flu, we were able to move a little further because we can perform uh, protection assays and and try to see if. Uh, these viruses were in fact immunogenic and also protective. And so we, we did find at least to a, uh, when mice were, were immunized with these viruses and then infected with uh, an, a lethal dose of the same virus, they were protected. Mm -hmm. So and then sort of underlining some of these um, evolutionary studies is also the idea that these, uh, or what motivates some of the work is that these could actually be prime candidates as new vaccines. So maybe tell us a little bit about that. How what's the motivation there versus you know maybe more traditional approaches with killed virus or attenu naturally attenuated viruses? Mm -hmm. Well, so uh, and you know this this is just I guess where I came from right from the beginning. I've always been uh, interested in the application of virology to vaccines. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, mm -hmm. even though it 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 isn't the the focus of my research, mm -hmm. but. Um, so we like to we like to I, I, I like to develop these kinds of new uh, attenuation strategies, but that are really upstream of <laughs> whether it'll actually be feasible and and usable. Mm -hmm. But I like the idea of using a virus's capacity to evolve against it. And so these are such high mutators that there's various ways either of, of either slowing down a virus. So imagine you can change the codon sequence so that, it's no longer evolvable. It's no longer able to access the mutations it would need to adapt to whatever environment it, it's going to encounter it during an infection, or on the other sense, to, to make it more fragile mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and fall off those cliffs mm -hmm. in the landscape. Mm -hmm. um, so here, it's what I guess the, for, for many viruses, the be of course, the best uh, vaccines tend to be live attenuated vaccines, and those were done empirically, but without really knowing how we're attenuating them. It was just hundreds of passages 
in a given host, uh, and then it loses the ability to infect the human. Mm -hmm. um, I imagine that this we've probably unknowingly done a lot of these things by doing that, right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's some evidence that some of these live attenuated vaccines are fidelity variants that can do more or fewer mutations. Mm -hmm. There's evidence that they are in bad mutational neighborhoods, mm -hmm. and so they tolerate less diversity around the sequence in which they find themselves. And so in a sense, they're, they're trapped in this distant region, and the only way back is to revert. Mm. Now, in the kind of approaches we're taking is, unlike most live attenuated vaccines that have one or two key attenuating determinants or nucleotide changes, so those are easy to revert back with one or two mutations, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. here we have a hundred or so equally contributing attenuating mutations, and none of which attenuate particularly well. Mm -hmm. A single serine change would do nothing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, even though the single uh, contribution is very low, so it would be hopeless as a vaccine on its own, by having a hundred of them, the contribution is significant, but the ability to revert 100 sites back to wild type is impossible. Yeah. So it could provide a, a better safety. And it, for these kinds of viruses, what I, what I like in, in this approach is that we are allowing the virus to appear exactly like wild type. The immune response sees the same protein sequence as wild type. Mm -hmm. And it's just as the virus replicate that we redirect its future. Yeah, really the, interesting. The um, recoding by Wimmer, which you mentioned, where... They make thousands and thousands of changes to change the codons and keep the amino acids the same, right? So those proteins are, are also the same. Um, is there any difference in terms of uh, usage as a vaccine? Would there be any difference from that approach versus yours? Uh, no, no, not as I, I guess the, the uh, end result is mm -hmm. the same. Um, I yeah. think what's nice is that the more we learn about how uh, codon changes will affect replication, translation, yeah, evolvability, yeah. robustness, it'll allow us to fine tune them in a more rational manner. So even the, the, so the many codon changes that were made by Vimmer's group, Adam Loring had the great idea to, to address that and say, well, what if we inadvertently altered robustness? And he showed in a nice paper in Cell Host and Microbe a few years ago that that is the case. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think we, we ultimately will be changing a number of parameters when we do this kind of work. But I think uh, my hope and goal is that we can get a good codon volatility index mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. that we can add to uh, the rational design of, of attenuating mutations for viruses for which we don't have uh, vaccines. So then in addition to the um, all of the recoding you did in these strains, you also developed another virus that you call the speedy stop virus. So what, what's that, and what's the additional <laughs> tool you used here? Yeah, so this this was this is this is great because it's when you kind of let your postdocs do their own thing, and so this was Gonzalo who came back with the idea. We here we have viruses that are more prone to stop mutations under the their own intrinsically bad replication um, fidelity. But in Coxsackie virus, uh, for the first few years in my lab, we were very focused on fidelity variants, which was a continuation of my work on polio from Raul Landino's lab. Uh, so for Coxsackie virus, uh, one of my PhD students, Nina Gnedig and uh, Stephanie Bocour, who's an engineer in our lab, they uh, identified a whole number of about 10 um, fidelity variants that were mutators. This was also uh, in collaboration with Ulf Pearson in um, um, Colorado State University. So there, it's basically you have a virus that intrinsically is making more mistakes. So it would allow us to exaggerate the phenomena. And I, when I present this, I always show this image that this was Gonzalo's imagery in that it's like taking a sports car, like a really good car down a really bad road full of potholes. Mm -hmm. And so the effect will just be exacerbated. And indeed, that's what we see uh, with our speedy stop in which the, the virus itself makes three or four times more mutations than regular uh, Coxsackie virus. And the result is even in animal models, we find more stop mutations in the progeny virion. Yeah, it's really interesting. So it's as if you've put it, the virus, mutationally speaking, 
into a bad neighborhood and then you gave it the keys to this Ferrari in a full tank of gas to sort of get itself in some Exactly. I mean, I always see it as Thelma and Louise, right? <laughs> that very last scene where they drive off the cliff. <laughs> And I'm just spoiler alert. Spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> well, I I I don't even know if people, uh, you know, the new generation even knows what Thelma and Louise is yeah, anymore. Yeah, that's right. right. <laughs> I want I wanted to just mention that, as you point out, I I like this approach because it it simply changes the sequence space without affecting, you know, dinucleotide bias, codon pair bias, which is all a a consequence of of Adam's paper, right, where he's changed all of these things and he's looking at space, but you don't know what what's affecting it. And as you say here, we only look at where we're pushing the virus. Is that a correct interpretation? It is, and uh, I always want to sound, sound smart and say that we thought of all these yeah, things right. at the beginning. <laughs> the reality is, we really were lucky in that serine and leucines don't actually do that mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. the papers by Wimmer and Simmons Lab came out much after we already started making these constructs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, each time it was like, oh crap, you know, we have to run back and make sure we didn't, you know, we didn't alter that. So, luckily, yes, yes. From the start, we were brilliant in thinking about <laughs> <laughs> it. Took, no, we were lucky. There's a, there's a luck factor there. Oh, well, sure. Absolutely. <laughs> you need to have that. Yeah, for sure. So I wanted to ask, you know, I mean, so much work in this paper, actually, not only to do this recoding for one virus, Coxsackie, but to do it for a second, the influenza A virus. So were there any notable, notable differences between the two? I mean, you did sort of the same strategy, but actually on two very different types of viruses. Mm -hmm. Did they sort of end up in terms of the fitness consequences that you were measuring and uh, the in vivo attenuation and things like this, did they behave exactly the same or were there differences actually between these two viruses? So in the, in, in the sense of attenuating, they behaved similarly and we've also seen it with some other viruses that we're now working on. So it tends to attenuate. I don't know if the mechanism is always the same, right? That, that we could be altering translation for some of them um what what uh is not presented in this work but is part of this bigger piece that we are doing is that some of these codons uh will ultimately or possibly alter not just robustness or maybe not robustness at all but evolvability and ad adaptability of the viruses now there we have seen some differences with constructs that are supposed to be more or less evolvable. Mm. And they don't always behave the same. I think, and I, from uh, what I can remember, of course, I don't have the data with me, but yeah. I, I recall that the flu, the, cert, the things that we categorized as more or less uh, robust, more or less evolvable, uh, was not the same according to whether it was leucine or serine. Mm. So we have to look more carefully at the codon volatility and what is actually where mutations at those codons are taking a virus. Because it's not, it's, again, it's never as clear. And to, be, to get a comprehensive model, I think we have to start really finding a way to measure and index each codon change hmm. and each starting codon. Yeah. Do you think there could be any clues in here to even things like host range? So the history of the host that that virus has been in might... Uh, reflect where it is on that day one, where where you find it when you grab that consensus sequence or begin the experiment. Um, will this sort of influence potentially even the ability of different viruses to infect many hosts to only infect one? What do you think? I, I think there there may be genetic signatures uh, that will help us understand this, but you can't you can't decouple any of this from any of all, like all the other things, right? The, the actual amino acid sequences, the tRNA availability for whatever target cell this virus, each virus has, the um, where the virus came from, whether it recombines regularly or not. Does it is it segmented or non? There's I think that it's a. It would be too simplistic to to imagine that we could find very conclusive. Uh, information about the the current nucleotide sequence and why. Yeah. Uh, but I I do think there's there's some signatures there that need to be explored, and we could do that on one level at the phylogenetic level. People have been looking at uh, 
what kind of sequences are explored by get, by certain viral families. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think what we need to do here in, in our own work and, and people that do our kind of stuff is, is to start asking about uh, the relevant tissues, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah, we, yeah. we tend to study these in HeLa cells or other immortalized cell lines, but uh, a lot of these viruses have very specific tissue tropisms and the, the tRNA availability is going to be different possibly in those. Yeah. And we don't necessarily have that information. Mm. And this is more relevant, I think, for the other codons. For serine leucine, for this virus, they're equally used, all six of them. Yeah. But we see codon biases in other, other, vi other codons and other viruses, and that would explain things. Mm. Marco, what do you think would happen if you had a suppressor cell line, a tRNA stop codon suppressor cell line, and you did this experiment with your altered population? I don't know. Interesting idea. <laughs> My, I, I mean, uh, the, the initial thought would be, ah, it's going to be the same as using your high fidelity, but maybe not. Maybe there's well, no, and and what I, I mean, I don't know because then, you know, the, these one to stop codons mm. can bring you to a stop, but they can also bring you to other amino acid changes, right? And Sudden, I mean, I don't know if suddenly they're able to explore and focus their exploration, so to speak. I, I mean, I know we shouldn't use active <laughs> yeah, verbs sure, sure. for evolution, <laughs> but but it may allow them to explore a previously dangerous neighborhood and find the good real estate in it, so to speak. Yeah, I'm I, trying to think of another half-baked analogy, maybe gentrifying the neighborhood. That would be, <laughs> yeah. that was, so that would be interesting, and, and there are such lines available. So uh, yeah, even if you yeah. used only one uh, stop codon suppressor, it might be informative, right? Yeah, yeah. Or well, Gonzalo, you know, if he's listening, there, there you, you, yeah. you, you have your first <laughs> grant application. <laughs> Are you still well, continuing this uh, this this area? You're gonna let Gonzalo Gonzalo take it all, or what? What's going on? So we'll we'll uh, uh, I guess I'll have to see what Gonzalo wants to mm -hmm. to work on. Um, in my group, I do let people take what they want because when they come, they they kind of explore what they want. I just, it's nice being the kind of lab we are. Virus evolution is very broad, and so ultimately, we can just change virus and have enough room for everybody. And mm -hmm. so, I tend and, and I learned a lot of this from from Raul as well. As you, I get people in, they work for a short time on an existing project, and then I ask them to kind of dream up what's comfortable and what's fun and create their own niche you know looking at what's out there it's what i did right i looked at what was out there and found my niche somewhere between evolution experimental evolution and virology um and and just work on that topic so i think uh gonzalo will will definitely continue developing probably the more um evolutionary interesting ideas rather than the strictly vaccine applications and in my own group, it depends on who the new people are and what their interests are. Yeah, so maybe just to wrap up on this um, study. So going back to the idea, we've kind of been dancing around a little bit, but this idea of fitness landscapes. So if we look in figure 6C, actually, you've drawn mm -hmm. fitness landscape. So maybe could we walk, I mean, we can't see it on the podcast, but uh, I would definitely suggest like pulling up the paper um, and then maybe walk us through this figure. <laughs> Yeah, so this is, um, again, because this work was initially a giant paper that was completely exploded into pieces by reviewers, mm. we realized that this piece is the easiest to explain and the first to publish. Mm. Um, and ultimately, this fitness landscape, we wanted to have a fitness landscape, but without actually showing all of our landscape models that we created. Mm. So... I'll say stay tuned for actually very exciting landscapes. But what is nice here is that we try to at least show, project in 2D. And if you notice, it's, that's not really a, a sequence space because what we have is just the different conditions of drugs mm -hmm. that we treated these populations. And then the mean entropy. So ultimately, the amount of mutations that accumulate over time. Mm -hmm. And the, we measured their competitive fitness of each of those treated populations. What it shows very visually and nicely is that wild type is always in a very happy place. It's yellow. It has those you know, upper fitness uh, measures. And it starts 
up high. And even as we increase the uh, mutagen concentration and treatment, it drops, but it still remains relatively high in fitness. Whereas the one to stop populations are stuck in sequence space. Mm. So here they start at very neutral, low fitness, and they plummet further down as they're mutagenized. Mm -hmm. uh, so this shows not only the plummeting shows their uh, fragility, so the lack of robustness, but they do, and this was an important thing, one, one of the reviewer comments that mm -hmm. mentioned it's not just robustness, mm -hmm. is that it looks like they're also unable to climb back up fitness peaks, right? So they're not as adaptable or evolvable. So you, you, you can try to change one without the other. The one is not directly always linked to the other, but they're, they're two traits that do come hand in hand sometimes. Mm -hmm. Some of the uh, wild type areas seem to be close to the, the red ones. Is that just a trick of the, of the, uh, the graph or sometimes? Well, the the, yeah, yeah, down. they are. I mean, you have to look at the color. And so the, it's true. The, 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 the under color of the red of the red populations of the one to stops tend to be blue, mm -hmm. right? Or or aquamarine. So they're low fitness. Um, they do the 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 mutagenized uh, wild type populations reach the fitness levels of the unmutagenized one to stop populations mm -hmm. as they're being passaged. So it's like they're in a, they're starting off already lower on the landscape. Looks to me uh, like if, the uh, like if you go to the mock right, the the wild type is getting a little blue there at the left. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, and that that naturally that that happens. I mean, these are experimentally evolved populations. We passage them mm -hmm. over five cycles, um, and in in multiple replicates. So sometimes, whether it's for whatever reason, it could be just the genetic drift or founder effect of a bad. Mm -hmm. uh, virus that carried on to the next series of, in, of infections. It, it's just that you naturally have lost fitness. So there's a lot of variability and you end up having yeah, to look yeah. at mean measures or, or, me, or the, the average o over many replicates. What we, what we did find with the no stop control is yeah. that it displayed more robustness. It's not on this map, but ultimately it's positioned in the same place as wild type, but the drops were less severe. Mm -hmm. Got it. I have to say I bristle when you say a bad virus because I don't I don't know any bad viruses. You know? Yeah, yeah, they're, I know. All, they're, they're all good viruses. They just sometimes find themselves in bad neighborhoods. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, 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 I'm the worst person for terminology. Yeah, it's, it's just I, I fight it all my life, so <laughs> I carry it into the science atmosphere too. <laughs> this episode is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron's mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone while supporting a more sustainable food system, setting the highest standards for ingredients, and building a community of home chefs. For less than $10 per person per meal, Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with pre-portioned ingredients so you can make delicious home-cooked meals in 40 minutes or less. You can customize your recipes every week based on your dietary preferences, and there's no weekly commitment. You only get deliveries when you want them. They have a freshness guarantee. It promises that everything in your delivery arrives ready to cook or they'll make it right. And because they ship exactly what you need, they reduce food waste. This October, Blue Apron is celebrating its fifth anniversary by bringing back its top 20 recipes picked by the Blue Apron community for a limited time. Now, Blue Apron's all about giving people fresh recipes to explore as they learn to cook new dish after new dish, which is why they don't normally repeat recipes within a year. So that's why this limited time offer is so exciting. So that's pretty cool. All the favorites are going to come back. Blue Apron is pretty cool. I like it because I hate shopping. I don't mind cooking, but shopping is a bore. I don't like grocery stores. And it's great to have everything shipped to your to your doorstep and go through the, the cooking. And it's especially great with, with uh, kids because you can say, hey, Let's put this together. It's really quick. Normally, they don't want to deal with it, and they can learn to be great cooks themselves. So try Blue Apron's all-time customer favorites. You can go to blueapron.com slash twee to get $30 off your first delivery and free shipping. That's blueapron.com slash twee. You'll love how good it feels and tastes 
to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Did you get hungry listening to that? Yeah, and I actually feel like a new man for uh, many reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so I have to say, Vincent, I'm in the game. I have finally (laughs) dabbled in a Blue Apron order. And, uh, you know, not too shabby. So um, we ate a couple of these Blue Apron. My wife and I ate a couple of these Blue Apron meals Mm -hmm. and uh, pretty delicious. Did you you do it together? Did, Did she do it? Did you do it? How'd that work? Uh, some of both. So, um, <laughs> Good. <laughs> she prepared one. I prepared another. Good. Um, yeah. All right. Glad you like it. It is good stuff and delicious food. All right. Th- uh, now let's, let's do some picks and we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Good idea. We have plenty of um, some great emails in the mailbag, but we'll, uh, we'll return to that next episode yeah. and, and catch up. Thanks for all of the letters. Really great stuff there. Um, moving to the picks of the week. So my pick of the week is... Um, a website called Global Tagging of Pelagic Pelagic Predators. And so um, what this is, is sort of a repository, actually, of a number of ecological studies. And so these are um, scientists who are tagging different marine species. So we're talking about marlins and sharks and tuna and even elephant seals and sea turtles. And then they're following their migrations. Uh, under the ocean, sometimes thousands of mile long migrations. And it's really fascinating. You can just go to these Google Earth maps and find, you know, an individual salmon shark that has migrated mm. thousands of miles. <laughs> it's I really just, cool. <laughs> I, yeah, I just love that this is all kind of happening under the surface. Yeah. Uh, Nels, you know what pelagic means? Like open ocean or something, I think. Yeah, away from the, you know, the yeah. shore or the bottom. Mm-hmm. I love these these ocean terms, pelagic. I like benthic and all of that stuff. <laughs> I just like the words. It's really cool. But this is a good site. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. You can kind of pick your favorite elephant seal and watch it swim up to the, uh, or yeah, yeah, I guess. Is that what seals do? Swim? Yeah. Up to the um, Aleutian Islands, for example. I mean, it's just really crazy how how far these things go. Oh, yeah. And how deep they can dive as part of their sort of everyday living. Just up and down the coast there. Look, from like Baja, California, all the way up to Alaska. Yeah, exactly. Amazing. With, and, uh, with, with no motors. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Some of them coming out of uh, Marco's old stomping grounds near San Francisco. That's right. Bay as well. Yeah. How about you, Vincent? What's your pick of the week? Well, you know, I have a continuing um, a series of complaints with the current administration when it comes to science based matters. I've voiced some of those before. I have an article in the Times entitled, Why Has the EPA Shifted on Toxic Chemicals? An Industry Insider Helps Call the Shots. Mm -hmm. So this is about a scientist, PhD, who worked for the chemical industry. She now uh, shapes the policy on hazardous chemicals. And so uh, there is a chemical perfluoro Octanoic acid. It's been linked to a variety of diseases, including kidney cancer, birth defects, immune system disorders, and more. It was extensively regulated. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now, a uh, this EPA official, uh, Nancy Beck, she, she uh, joined the EPA Toxic Chemical Unit in May as a top deputy. For the five previous years, she was an executive at the American Chemistry Council, which is the Chemical Industries Trade Association. And she has um, she wants to rewrite the rule, a rule to make it harder to track the health consequences of the chemical and therefore to regulate it. And so this is very bothersome because it's all about allowing uh, industry to make more money by being less regulated with no regard uh, for to health risks caused by these things. And so I think this is, uh, and she thinks these are phantom risks, which is a mm. typical position of anyone who is support, who is pro-business and doesn't want any regulation. Mm. So I think this is really, really despicable. Um, you know, it's not all about preserving industry profits. I think a healthy population is the most important thing. We should take care of each other, not try and make money off of each other. And this is just one of many, many examples of where this uh, administration is ignoring science and uh, wants profits and doesn't care about people's health. And uh, yes, yeah, sort, 
Yep. Sort of feels like the fox is running the hen house, so to speak. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Marco, how about you? Can Do you have a surprise uh, listener pick that you might point well, to? Well, you know, I, I not not in the same way, but I, I, I'd like to do point people towards three young PIs that mm. I think are doing cool stuff. Mm-hmm. Great idea. So Siobhan Duffy is one of my favorite evolutionary virologists. Uh, she's at Rutgers, I believe, mm-hmm. and has her own lab uh, now for a couple of years. Does really cool things uh, looking at both RNA and DNA viruses and, and small DNA viruses and evolutionary rates. Check her website out and her work. It's, it's fantastic. Agreed. And then in the flu, I've recently discovered, uh, partly from this uh, uh, ASV mathematical virology session mm. that I did mm-hmm. uh, is Seema Lakdawala, who's mm-hmm. at uh, Pittsburgh, and Chris Brook at Champaign Urbana. Yeah, that's right. Is that what it's yep. called? Yeah, yeah, it is. Yep. Yeah, so University those two Illinois. are, yeah, those are two new PIs doing really cool stuff in, in influenza, uh, in various things, in, pa- in packaging, assembly, evolution, etc. So look at those three people to watch. Couldn't agree more. So we've Great been spots, we've been yeah. trying to get Siobhan on Twiv for for some time now. So uh, we're still working on that, and and we did a paper of of Seema's on uh, Twiv a couple of uh, episodes ago, and she was the next day she was just thrilled. She I can't <laughs> be, I can't believe our first paper got done on Twiv. <laughs> I'm over the top, she wrote. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Great, Chris Brooke. Also, keep an eye on this fellow. Very interesting guy. Yep. Right. Yep. All right, that's Twivo 24. You can find it at Apple Podcasts, microbe.tv slash Twivo. And if you have a favorite podcast app that you use to listen, please subscribe. You'll get every episode automatically, and it helps us with our numbers, which helps us get support of the show. And in fact, if you like what we do, consider us uh, f- supporting us financially. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute for all the different ways that you can do that. Over on Twiv, I just designed a world tour T-shirt. Mm. So on the front is it is the regular Twiv logo. Then on the back it says 2017 Twiv World Tour and lists all the places we were this year. Very huh. cool. Not that many, but you know, <laughs> I'm not a rock band. We're not rock bands. <laughs> well, <laughs> just wait. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll see. And send your questions and comments Twivo at microbe.tv. I want to thank our guest today from the Pasteur Institute, Marco Vignuzzi. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. How many how many scotches did you have, Marco? Well, we're out of whiskey, actually. That was <laughs> I was about to like pull the fire alarm and get this building cleared. <laughs> Nels, what's going on? You, you drank all of the whiskey. Well, it's we're off to a great start. That explains his washroom break. Well, we'll <laughs> correct. We'll just. Uh, Take the conversation to the bar. Are you going out tonight for dinner or anything? Yeah, we'll definitely grab some drinks and then uh, go from there. Tomorrow, Marco uh, it won't be posted in time for Twivo, but Marco is giving a seminar here Cool. as part of a new speakeasy secret seminar series. So mm-hmm. You have to have the code word to get into this thing. Nice. But, uh, looking forward to this. Marco, tomorrow. what's your Twitter handle? Remind me. It's Vignuzzi Lab. Lab. One word. Very good. Yeah. Nels Eldy is at cellvolution.org. You can find him on Twitter, L Early Bird. Thanks, Nels. Hey, thank you, Vincent. Good to be here again in our um, audio upgraded <laughs> studio. And I think a spectacular episode, a Twivivo hybrid Terrific. evolution Absolutely. and virology coming together. This has been fun. Absolutely. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank the sponsor of this show, Blue Apron. The music you hear on Twivo is performed by Trampled by Turtles. You can find their work at trampledbyturtles.com. You've been listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Until then, be curious. <laughs>